Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 328th new social environment. I'm Louis Block, the production editor at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Mel Kendrick and Phyllis Tuckman. We're also thrilled to have the poet Edwin Torres here who will read to close today's program. We've started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host. A preeminent American sculptor, Mel Kendrick's practice has involved the use of cast bronze, concrete, a variety of woods, rubber, resin, as well as investigations with cast paper. Kendrick addresses philosophical, conceptual, and fundamental questions around sculpture, namely the relationship between the object as we experience it and the clearly evident means by which it was created. Currently, Kendrick is the subject of a traveling retrospective, now on view at the Addison Gallery of American Art in Andover, Massachusetts, traveling to the Parish Art Museum in Watermill, New York. He is joined by critic and art historian Phyllis Tuckman, who teaches and writes, writes about art, particularly sculpture. She has taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts. She is currently writing a book on the life and times of Robert Smithson. She is also an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Over to you, Phyllis. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. Hello, Mel. Hi, Phyllis. So, Mel, I'm very excited about your show that there's just such a beautiful selection of your work that's been brought together, plus this book, mm. which uh, is available to everyone. Beautiful reproductions, wonderful text, including one by Nancy Prinzenthal, who is a sculpture maven. Um, I'm fascinated. I mean, I know you've worked in other materials, but Mel, you seem from the get-go to have worked in wood. Can we, can we start with the slides? Yes. Thank you. So Mel, what was it, what, what was it about wood that, that, that initially attracted you and that has kept you, um, interested all these decades later. No, we want the first one. The wall. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yes, well, uh, you know, I, I feel a lot of it is situational. It's like where you are at a certain time. And uh, I was in lower Manhattan, uh, you know, fixing up my loft, other people's lofts, and I had to learn how to do carpentry. I really didn't know. And, you know, wood was there available and I used it quite a bit. Uh, and I w used a lot of that construction wood with my early pieces. Uh, so it was really something availability and my learning how to use it. And that is kind of what started the wood. I can go on and talk about why wood. <laughs> Uh, why I liked wood as I got further. Uh, and that was that it, unlike steel or something else, wood uh, has its own memory in it in terms of once you cut it, you cannot uncut it. And this became more and more important to my work. So it's not like uh, once you cut something, you can weld it together and chase it. Once you cut it, you're, you're dealing with that. So anything you do with wood, if I stay on the same piece, will, will stay visible in, in the record. Kind of like how maybe you can't really erase everything in a drawing. Uh, you always see an echo. So, so it's always there. So it's really the timeline that kept me interested in it. And the fact that, uh, you know, if I did something or made a mistake or whatever, that I could uh, un undo it only by you know, gluing it back together by doing something that was so obvious uh, and evident that that became, you know, part of it. 
And uh, another reason is very simple is that I was living in, you know, lower Manhattan uh, in a loft and that, you know, I never learned how to weld <laughs> uh, and they couldn't have done it there anyway. And I've regretted that, but that's really has had no impact on the work I've wanted to make. Uh, so, you know, wood, wood was uh, readily available and I learned how to use it. That, that's the basis. I love how you're saying, uh, now, can we go back to the first one? Um, I love how you're saying, you know, it has its memory, you can't really change it. One of my favorite uh, passages in um, uh, a, a Calder book I read was that um, Calder's father, as you know, was, a, was an old fashioned sculptor. And um, he was, he was a, a, a modeler and, um, and a carver. And one day Calder's mother went in the father's studio and looked at a statue and said, oh, I liked it better yesterday. <laughs> it, it, it's like, it says a lot about his father and mother. Um, so Mel, we're beginning with this piece from the early eighties um, that, 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 that hangs on a wall. Why, you know, when I, when I see a relief by a sculptor in the beginning, I think, well, did you start as a painter? Why, why, why is this like the first piece we really know by you? Well, um, the, this piece and the next piece are really ending pieces. So in, in this context, they're starting pieces. But I had been doing a number of pieces where I was bending wood and a number of them were large and on the floor. And then also I began, you know, doing some on the wall, the actual context or the, the, the central thing, the element in the piece came from uh, some drawings I saw by chance of Giacomo Bala uh, in London, where he glued a small square of paper on a bigger sheet and he would do something in the middle. And then the line, as soon as the line moved from the small piece, to the other piece, it just went winging out to the side. And uh, it, it just, I like that. Came in, it got busy and then left. And that, that's kind of something that I was doing. So the busy portion was all busy, pretty busy at this point, but uh, the center usually is based on some sort of a square or off square or cube in the center. And then I would have these lines shooting off and you know trying to maintain the curves that they projected. I and mean, that's where it started. This piece actually is plaster and I'm, playing with different ways of, of uh, curving wood, uh, laminating wood or curfing as it's called, the squares uh, to bend wood. And uh, then the little part shifting sections of wood from uh, one side of, to the other, cutting them out and putting them on the other side. And these are all elements that uh, I continue on with, but uh, everything is sort of in this piece from that, you know, the culmination I would say of the seventies uh, you know, which in my first show at John Weber Gallery was 1980 and had similar pieces. Can we have the next one? Well, because this is room size. That must have, if it, it, this must have taken you a while to uh, put together. It did. It did. And the funny thing is it is room size and it really was an installation and I didn't show it. Uh, partially because my gallery moved from its nice space on 420 West Broadway to a smaller space. Uh, but this also is really me trying to get what I consider the extreme elements from that I was developing the wall pieces into a floor piece because it's, again, it's probably the last, it is the last floor piece I made of this type. And uh, it was, you know, things change when you change scale, like how the curving is done, how all that. And uh, so I uh, really like the wall pieces that if you were in my studio, then there'd be wall pieces and then there'd be a, something like this on the floor that, you know, I worked on over months. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, and the other thing I say about the work leading up to this, it was much more had an architectural base 
because I was using architectural wood, the standard lumber yard wood, four by fours, four by sixes, whatever. And sometimes I would even draw the floor plan of the piece I was building with chalk on the floor. So it was really a projection of the floor up into the sculpture, uh, which interested me then. But uh, then, you know, things changed. And uh, at that point, I would <laughs> point to the piece in the back corner there, which I think is the next slide, uh, because I completely changed the scale and my way of working. But it came right. This, this piece came literally out of that piece. It was created from a section of the other piece. Uh, and I just tried it out. I liked the way it looked and I thought, hmm, you know, can I justify this? Is this a sculpture? Is this what I'm doing? And of course, uh, as things went on, that is what caught my attention. And, uh, you know, I, I, I liked the more immediate response. And also, you know, things already started to develop, the, the lines on it, the shifting pieces around, the drawing quality uh, that I kept on working with. And it just felt so much more freer, but I had to adjust my thinking to this idea of a freestanding object, which really wasn't uh, <laughs> what was going on around me, uh, you know, at that time. Um, now, the last piece was obviously constructed. You, you, you brought parts together, but this piece strikes me and subsequent pieces as being carved. Is there, is there a difference? Did you become a carver or are these still assembled? Well, both. I, I think that, you know, I never really thought of myself as a carver because of, uh, you know, maybe it's the cliche, you know, carving a piece of wood with a chisel and winding up with a pile of wood chips on the floor, uh, you know, to get at what you're making. And I never, never worked that way. Uh, for me, it was more, I was very impressed, you know, by oh, Tatlin, the, the, con the uh, constructivist, the early work, uh, you know, non-objective, uh, you know, way of putting things together. And that's kind of uh, how I viewed this. So, uh, but, you know, say I carve into the wood with a saw, uh, but that enabled me to remove the part that I carved out as opposed to destroying it. So, so it's a mixture of the two. I'll call it a hybrid for the moment. <laughs> yeah. Can we have the next one, please? Okay, so you were able to empty out space. And one of the things that interested me years ago, as you know, I wrote a piece uh, called The Road Now Taken, um, a, a bad pun on the road not taken. But it seemed to me that you were going in a direction that no one else was taking. I mean, we were there were there was minimalism. There was there were earthworks. There there was eccentric abstraction. Um, wasn't it? Did you feel courageous at the time working with wood? <laughs> when you say courageous, uh, you know that translates to scared, uh, <laughs> you know, more like, huh, nobody's doing this. What am I doing? Uh, so I, the, the jump was to make a specific object like this and actually uh, to put it on a base, a base that I fabricated uh, for certain reasons, but uh, because I was used to dealing with much more environmental things. Uh, you know, I love Smithson and Judd and Lewitt and every, you know, there's a lot of other work around that was influencing me. And that's why, uh, you know, if I thought about that, I couldn't, I couldn't justify what I was doing, but you know, that didn't matter because I was seeing things like, uh, I mean, this, all the pieces don't adhere to the same, uh, rules, but I mean, I know if you look at this piece, it's the back part is flipped up and come up on the top. And that's where you get the Rorschach. That's why you get the, uh, uh, the flat surface. And uh, it was called white wall. And I really liked the drawing to figure something out. Uh, so as my, not my frustration, but my interest in drawing without actually drawing on paper, it was how could I draw 
in a material. And that some of that was quite literally drawing on the surface. Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? Uh, you know, where am I going to cut it? And, and all that was very much present in, in these small works. But how they stayed in the room was something that went completely against what was going on uh, at the time, uh, because it was dangerously close to early modernism, if you, you know, it, it, uh, without, you know, the context of the way I was, I was thinking about it, which was through, uh, you know, process and material and finding this language, just because of the scale and how you approached it. But at some point, I thought scale itself is not an idea. In other words, uh, it's more of a mental space. You can stand opposite an object like this that's you know, maybe 16 inches tall uh, and walk around it and project yourself into it. In other words, I'd like to almost say it is scale less that, that once you have focused on it, uh, that you know you're there. It might you know it doesn't have to be the size of a room, and the reason for the metal bases was I was still dealing with physicality uh, and the body in a sort of, well, in it referencing the, not the body, but the fact that when you look at a work of art, uh, one of my pieces, you'd be standing on the floor and I'd, here I'd make this smaller object and I put it on a metal, an open metal base. And you could see the structure, you could see how it was supported uh, and the, the metal this, you know, went down to the floor, you're standing on the floor, and then the sculpture was in a more cerebral space, you know, closer to eye level. And uh, this, this was you know, very exciting to me. And I mean, just by reference, what I didn't want to use and did not use was what I call the museum box base, which is a white plinth uh, sealed, uh, which removes the object from uh, the world. And I wanted this to stay in the world. Uh, not be, you know, that, I mean, removes an object, maybe like a, like a frame does with a painting or a drawing. Uh, so this was all important to me as I worked this out, but it is true, no one was doing it. And, you know, it's a joke since this, the difficulty of doing something like this at that time is really hard to comprehend now because it seems so simple and obvious. But at that time, it was very, uh, not very much not what people were thinking about. It, it is hard to describe how, 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 how counter this was to that moment. I mean, I think when I look at this today, I think the closest person, uh, you might think about some Eva Hesse, and that was certainly not close. <laughs> Influential though, I mean, you know, that seeing her work was a, another, you know, as I was looking at older artists, different artists, that, that her work was something that opened up a whole realm of possibilities, you know. So in other words, I, I think you, not sublimate, what do you say, you, you absorb all these things and you, these things come out, but in different forms. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> Can we have, the, yeah, the next, because now, um, you didn't you didn't stay with color in this way so were you experimenting with the possibility of adding color to your sculpture i should have been but i wasn't <laughs> this was kind of i liked to i color coded this piece and i said you know what color red yellow blue and white and uh you know a piece made up of four kind of solid chunks of lumber, which I coated that way. So you I actually had a block of wood that uh, was made of four blocks of wood and each one was colored uh, with this color. So that when I actually uh, made the piece, which was something, I, one of the few pieces that I was thinking about making it really big, I, I thought, hey, you know, it'll be easier, I'll color code it. And uh, that's what, what happened. And uh, it's funny, I didn't really stay with it that much, uh, but I was very interested, uh, you know, it just probably had more to do with Lewitt or Barnett Newman or something, but I, I just, uh, you know, love the way it looked, but I, I didn't really stay with it that much at this point anyway. Did you show this in New York? I, I, I can't wait to see this at the parish. 
Uh, no, this piece, uh, I, I showed it, I think, no, I don't think I ever showed it, actually, funny. I thought maybe I showed it at the Hood Museum or, yeah, I, I'm sure I showed it somewhere, uh, you know, but purchased or something, but not, not in a gallery show. And to me, it was a piece on the way to being another piece. And whenever I feel a piece is like that, you know, it's not something I'm necessarily going to let go because uh, that's kind of like things change. Uh, and so it's like holding on to a stage uh, or as Mrs. Calder Sr. would <laughs> say, you know, you see something go by when you're making something. You see something that is, you know, so interesting, uh, but you don't want to lose it uh, because it's going to disappear into the final piece. So this felt that way and I felt I had to hold on to it. So no, it hasn't really been shown until now. Wow, what an interesting way. So this is perfect. Now we have pedestals and we have small pieces. So was it, were these like, did you feel like these were like models working so small or it was just easier to work small or what was why why did why were so many of your of your sculptures initially um something that you measured in inches rather than yards um well i think i i, I wanted to have it both ways i absolutely believed and i still believe these are sculptures these are sculptures they're not maquettes people want to say oh is that a maquette and say no no but uh, just to belie that, uh, if you look at two pieces, the piece uh, in the first picture, which is, you know, the colors aren't as bright, is in the back. And, and then in back in the room, just before it is the, to the right, is the same piece, how I originally made it. Uh, so in this case, I did say, well, hey, that would be great. And I did move it up in scale. But when I move something up in scale, it's not just, uh, it's rebuilding it. So they're always different. So it's not like uh, taking, a, you know, whatever, a, a computer scan or something and enlarging it with, you know, or enlarging it even the way the Kooning sculptures were, you know, they're kind of great large, but the marks in them are his thumb marks writ large. Whereas in these, the saw cuts, everything I did had to change to make the bigger piece. But the sculpture themselves, uh, you know, and I, I do have to give a nod to, you know, Picasso and the glasses of absinthe, of which until I saw, I didn't know there were so many of them, <laughs> but uh, because that showed me that that's all you need. You don't need much. It's scale is not the point here. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's sort of a freeing revelation. So I was making sculpture, definitely, period, when I made these pieces. You know, it's funny because I write about sculpture, but I forgot the word maquette because it's not, it's just not something that someone of our generation, maquettes just didn't, weren't made. No, and you could go even further to the Italians and the, uh, whatever, whoever, uh, back, you know, they had Bozzetti, I think, Bozzetti's were little clay drawings for bigger pieces. Um, but, but I was not thinking that way. I thought that on these bases, standing with these pieces, that was the whole experience. Yeah, I, I, and they're beautiful. Can, can, and will all of those go to the parish? That, that, uh, I'm sh pretty sure that will. We're, the, the parish show is yet to be determined because the Addison show is, if anyone's ever been there, it's a remarkable museum, uh, in uh, Andover, Massachusetts, but it opened at the same time as the Whitney. So there's a lot of back and forth as being the, the two, at that point, American uh, Museums of American Art. Um, so they have a great collection. And uh, the parish, the, the theater I have nine rooms of uh, you know, beautiful gallery space and the parish is beautiful too, but it's going to be considerably different. And I, probably with those nine rooms, I might have to drop, I will have to drop some stuff out, but the room I, we just looked at will definitely be there. I mean, that's, because <laughs> that's seminal to me. That was, you know, 1983 through 1989 or something when I was thinking can, and working that way. Can we go back to that, the, the piece with all the, this, 
Oh, okay. It must have been the second one because because uh, the there was this, a large wit up by the ceiling. Oh, I mean, I love I, later, later, yeah. I love the Addison. I think that Addison is one of the treasures of uh, the Boston area. Um, <laughs> And and did you feel having gone to Andover, did were did you did you feel as a young artist a connection with Frank Stella and and Carl Andre having gone there? Well, I, I knew they went there. I didn't feel I mean, you know, there's I didn't feel close to them because of that. And uh, my experience Andover was very mixed. Uh, I uh, I wouldn't say it was I loved it. Uh, I don't have to go into all that, but I will say that the museum was there and a really forward thinking, remarkable art department sort of Bauhaus based. And, uh, you know, we made photographs and movies and uh, things that you just wouldn't do in a high school. Uh, so that I think sort of saves me there. But that was just those are just famous guys who went there. I didn't know them. <laughs> yeah. Can can we go back? Can we continue to? Yeah. Okay. So, so what I love is that you see how you're going slowly. You're teaching yourself how to do this. So, where did the holes come from? Um, I well, like with the color, I was experimenting with this idea of you know surface versus interior, which became much more literal later on. But uh, so I all the time. And I mean, with this, and I think the smaller works, I started working with more or less a system of fabricating myself uh, a large block of wood. Uh, and it would take you know, like number of, this is poplar, four inches thick, kiln dried, and I'd make a big sandwich of it. And then there it would be, and then I would start, you know, cutting into it to make the sculpture. But uh, in this one, I, <laughs> really for some reason i wanted to change the surface and i wasn't going to paint it but i this idea of surface recognition of structural recognition of moving one part from here and putting it there and uh so in this one i used uh actually if you look at it, i used the grooves which you see in the lower left and the upper left and i used the drilled holes on another portion of it so uh once that was done, then I went back to making the sculpture and then where they turned up was just almost happenstance. Uh, but I like those layers of information, possibly retrievable, not necessarily so. Oh, I love the uh, term layers of information. Totally. Can we have the next, please? So this this looks more like you, you a tree trunk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a f funny story, uh, but I was living on Duane Street and the guy at that point on the second floor uh, was a uh, dealer in woods and a flatbed truck, I was out on the fire escape, flatbed truck pulled up with this beautiful looking piece of cedar all gnarly and twisted. And so, you know, I ran down there and, you know, it wasn't very expensive and I hauled it into the basement where my studio was. and. Uh, you know, I started working on it, uh, which which was a big change for a number of reasons. But I can tell, you know, what got me there was here was something I didn't have to manipulate the surface like in the last piece. I was given this surface. I was given the nature of this wood and it was beautiful. So then the question is, well, how can you do anything? What am I trying to do? And uh, at this point, I was using a chainsaw. It was kind of I was trying to, I'm fighting back against perhaps the busyness of the earlier work or the completion of those pieces. Good things, but you know, you want to change. And in this case, dealing with this large piece of cedar uh, with a chainsaw was quite a change. You're losing control. And so I, you can see, I mean, I can't, you can't see all of it, but you can see that that piece in front was above it, was part of the tree above it. Uh, flip it over and it would go there. And uh, so in essence, I did very little and I was actually sort of testing myself. So sort of saying, how this thing is beautiful. How little can I do to it? And, you know, to make it a sculpture uh, or maybe, I mean, they'd say it this way, maybe to own it. Uh, 
And I got into this idea that, you know, that it was sort of um, nature versus intellect or and, and there's a, that's the wrong parallel, but, uh, you know, I'd say saw cuts uh, were, you know, necessarily straight and geometric and the tree itself was organic. And so it's playing against those two things. Uh, and then I, I did, I actually showed it, uh, this piece is at the Whitney now, but I, I showed it uh, without that base. And so here's, this is a good another transition in the work. The tree itself was hollow down through the center of it. And so I had this other cedar, that heavy, you know, cedar on the bottom and I made an op a square with a square cut. So that hole continued down through the base. And then at the very bottom, I got more cedar logs and I cut them in a circle to reiterate that circle, so this is that, that hole. So it's really a vertical transition from, uh, you know, top to bottom where, where the whole thing's connected. And it's not a metal base and it's not on the floor, but it's really the base being part of the sculpture. I mean, now it is part of the sculpture, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the way, you know, I was thinking of it, that, uh, you know, this should all be together somehow. Is, is the next slide the one that I think it is? Uh, no. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. So, so I, 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 there, there is the last one in the back on the left. And here we see the Solowit um, wall drawings ringing the room at the Addison, which is one of the pluses of visiting there. But these, the, these, this piece in the foreground, Mel, that is so eccentric. <laughs> well, you know, it's just me trying to, you know, oh, you know, it's funny. In one sense, every piece I do, do have done is so interrelated. They're so interrelated in terms of my approach, but the physicality, the looks of them is very different. Uh, and, you know, the specific uh, kind of challenge I gave myself uh, but this was after that cedar piece. These were early 90s, 91, 92. And uh, in this case, I uh, was still taking large pieces of wood and laminating them into larger pieces of wood. So I'd be making, in essence, a minimal sculpture, uh, a block. And if you look at the upper left of the left-hand one, there's a square in the wood an open square up, up, up above there. And not, not that one, the black one. I, I can't know. Can I move that? Anyway, up there, there's a square. And so the block of wood that I made, kind of like the other sculpture I was talking about, had a hole all the way through it. Uh, and so that would turn up when I started working with the wood. But the other thing is the black. This is black raw linseed oil with lamp black pigment. So I would coat that whole or initial piece of block of wood with this uh, gooey substance. And raw linseed oil, as opposed to boiled linseed oil, doesn't dry or will in a number of years. Uh, and so then I set about to do what I was doing before, you know, take the block, break it down into elements that I thought were very interesting on their own, almost sculptures on their own. And, uh, you know, with a few ideas. I wanted to get them up high in the air. So some of the elements I made were like those wood legs in the front one. I sort of thought of them as like, a, I don't know, TV table legs or something. Uh, and that was, uh, I did a lot of this working with the central part on a gantry in the air. Uh, and I wanted these things to just sort of blow together, not fit so nicely as the other work had. I just wanted it to be a cluster. Uh, that and unfortunately they're kind of put together that way as I found now that I've had to rebuild them uh, a number of times because I did them very quickly or sometimes not so quickly but the black oil was wet and it got on our hands it got everywhere so as you look at the pieces you see handprints uh, around it because you know we'd have to hold it and it was kind of this whole process oriented thing this language of making something and it put a timeline in it because I was very much into the idea that each sculpture was just a point in time 
that you are working, working, and then it's there. So I liked being able to have that history, just like the cuts and the glue in it. And uh, yeah, so that's, then I got them. The last thing I had to do was figure out how to make them stand. Uh, now that I put this, all this stuff together, so randomly almost. Uh, and that's where the legs that I'd made, but even then in the piece in back, uh, I had to add some pipes, black pipes, uh, legs to make it stand, uh, which is very much like uh, the supports of a dinosaur in the Museum of Natural History. Things that are there holding it up, they're necessary, but you're sort of not meant to see them. But, you know, I made this, so you are seeing them, and I put them there, and it's all part of the sculpture. Uh, I sort of like that idea too. So I'm a, I guess these are sort of really thoughts of presentation to some degree, but uh, they had to stand and I had to put, you know, what one could say prosthetic legs on them in order to make them stand. Uh, and so it was a whole process. And I did five of these, uh, which I showed in a row, sort of the development of them. Um, no, but that was, they were very exciting. Did you miss having a pedestal? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, it's not like I love the pedestal. It was just how to get a small object into the, you know, frame of reference in this, in a way you could look at it. Uh, no, I, I liked working large. I liked, uh, you know, and, and the base on the cedar piece in back, you'd hardly call that a pedestal or in the one down the center, uh, that three legged piece, uh, you know, that block is part of the piece but it is the base so i was changing a lot and a lot of my bases were now solid wood instead of steel but uh no didn't miss it <laughs> incorporated it i guess i find I, that there are five of these i find them very emotional like you're kind of waiting for them to fall down but they're not i hope <laughs> yeah no I, I think that well this gets into all you know aspects of abstraction. What what is abstraction? That's something that I tried to approach in the title of the show. Is because you know seeing things in things. I, I don't. You have to see when you make something that is, for lack of a better term, abstract. There has to be some reason to relate to it, or else it just becomes pattern uh, or design used for something else. So uh, that. That's the question, and I, I veered away. I stayed away from anything representational in terms of abstracting from the body or abstracting from you know, so you could see parts, fragments that related to something in the outside world. And I just wanted them to be totally self-referential. So if you see these as emotional, <laughs> I, and then I see them as emotional. I, I, I it's hard, uh, hard to say. Uh, I do think that they've been through something. They feel like they're survivors. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think the two of us are survivors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this looks like you made a cast of 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 the wood piece. Is is am I correct in assuming that? Right. Um, well, take those pipe legs from the last part. And I, I think I was always, you know, I had it in my mind sometimes, how little can I do? Uh, you know, I do something, you know, quickly, you know, and I, I had this log, probably a piece of firewood, uh, and I made a couple cuts and I, there, there's a slice in the upper left that I turned around, you know, the, uh, so it didn't fit quite. And then that, you know, little branch on the bottom was turned around because it wouldn't have been there. And then same thing, make it a sculpture. I put it on these pipe legs, uh, even with rubber feet. Uh, and I like that. So, you know, why not do it again to, you know, to really kind of understand what it was. And so this is uh, the first of a whole group of work where I'd been doing casting things in bronze at uh, the foundry. And uh, now I, uh, I found there, they had this uh, great uh, rubber, synthetic rubber material that was for very hard. 
uh, great translucent quality. And, you know, I did this in my own studio, so I made the mold and I cast it uh, in, you know, solid rubber, which is like amber. And this was fascinating to me because I guess I'm always trying to get inside things, but, you know, since bronze is only like quarter inch thick and all surface, this cast had the surface, but it also was liquid, felt like liquid and the light came through it. And so it was really a different thing. It was a, you know, it was a parallel object, which I showed side by side. And then, uh, you know, all these wood wedges, whatever it took to, to match the two up so that they stood exactly the same way. And so, yeah, this was a very important piece to me because it put the, the two, two objects together, you know, for consideration. I think the next slide is really, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were two of them. Yeah, that's Yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. So is the one on the left a bronze or that's wood and the one on the right is a cast? Yeah, the one on the left is simply wood. Uh, you know, it's just messing around. It was silver actually. And then uh, I painted it black and it, I liked the sheen, but you know, I wasn't even sure it was a sculpture. <laughs> I mean, what I do, I just did this thing and put legs on it. So I was always having this argument with myself. So I got back to the same thing, maybe the, the heightened absurdity of making a mold and casting it again. And again, and I used this, this amber rubber. And uh, that's, you know, what the other part is. And uh, what all the other things you see going on is uh, when I cast, the piece in rubber in the studio. Uh, I kept having to turn the mold so that there were pools, facets of rubber inside it. It wasn't solid rubber. And I was going to close it up and have it be like the first one. And I thought, you know, this is like where you see something along the way and you kind of go, huh, that's interesting. I'm going to lose that. So I thought, well, why don't I just put hinges on it and open it up and, and have both going on? I, I had you know, no justification for this. It was just uh, something I saw. Uh, and it's almost like an autopsy or, you know, it's, 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 it's a weird thing. And then the, the rubber one doesn't stand well like the wood one. So I had to put in steel supports and wedges and stones to try to match it up just the way the, the first one is, like the left side and the west side. So um, I, I love the absurdity of it. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, you know, again, for and there are more in the next picture. There's, there's several. I, I did like, yeah. I know. I want to go back. Well, I could talk about it here with the two on the left that we just saw, because of that white disc at the top that seems to be painted, and the legs. It seems almost anthropomorphic that they're they're almost like ballet performers mm -hmm. they have perfect the the one on the left especially has perfect posture and the way the leg is uh kind of uh almost on its toe but you didn't see them as anthropomorphic uh Although well i i think this the the black world has a lot to do with how we stand um you know and how an object is going to exist in space. So there are these parallels. Was I thinking of dancers? No, not at all. Um, but I was really kind of working off this absurdity in my own mind of uh, presenting this really peculiar log as a sculpture with, you know, the necessary legs to hold it up. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this is something I've talked about more recently, having set up the show, of course, it seems more anthropomorphic than I ever thought it was when I was making the work uh, because it had nothing to do with that. But, you know, anything vertical might be the body. But I think that the relationship to the body is more about that idea of standing than trying to recreate uh, an aspect of the body. Um, you know, I didn't, if I put legs on it, you know, that didn't mean people legs, I mean, tables have legs. I mean, you know, things need legs, things need to stand. And I was very definitely interested in like right back to the metal bases that everything had to stand on the floor in front of you. I wasn't gonna hang anything from the ceiling or 
do any tricks, uh, hidden supports. And uh, so everything that was necessary to make them stand, I put into the piece. I love it. Now, the piece that's on the extreme right, as opposed to what I think is the mold, the piece on the extreme right is 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 the the big the big circle the orb is that wood like the three yeah. elements above it yes um that is this is just like the first one oh it's not painted the one on the right is wood and the one on the left is the amber rubber i guess the way the light's hitting it or it got dark or you're not seeing light through it so much but it is the same thing of a wood piece that i made uh I was, I was sort of making these things of markers, not necessarily totems, uh, but, you know, I once actually with Tony Smith, I did my, my master's thesis on stone circles. And I was very into like what marks people, you know, put in the countryside, like stacking stones or something. And so I had the logs, I had this burl, which was kind of, is like almost too powerful to work with. It's like two beautiful things. So I pretty much destroyed it. Uh, with the holes, I had, you know, get it to a point where I could work with it. And then I stacked the logs on top and it was just a very basic thing, a very basic way of making a marker or just defining a spot. And then again, I did the same thing and I did the cast it in rubber and uh, did what I had to do to make the two of them stand the same way side by side. Uh, so, yeah. When you cast when you cast it in rubber, were you were you trying to find a way to be able to work larger using other materials? No, than... no, the, the rubber was very difficult. Um, that's why there are not that many of those pieces either. I mean, I did it in my studio. I had to create a vacuum tank and all sorts of things to mix it. Uh, and uh, it's not something that I felt like continuing, at least on my own. Uh, and uh, it was really this thing about matching up uh, two objects, uh, two aspects of the same thing uh, that could be viewed together somehow. Uh, but uh, the scale was just, I don't know, the scale again of the materials, but there's no way I was going to get any larger. I did a lot of smaller pieces because that was easier. But in this show at the Addison, out of sight to the right is another pair of pieces. So it was really more just to develop. It's not that piece, but it, more to develop the concept. Uh, no, I wanted the next slide. Yeah, yeah well, the next slide, because this is the next group of work. You know, this is sort of, I like the rubber because you saw the surface, but you saw it in it. And, you, and that amber, to me, referred back to the idea that this was molded and it's a liquid. And that felt very interesting to me next to the actual wood piece. Now, the next group here was uh, part of a group called Core Samples. And in this case, I was still working off the, uh, this uh, polemic or whatever, you know, the, the two objects relating to each other. But in this case, uh, I took something obvious, like a piece of birch log, and I broke it into small pieces, like many small pieces, uh, so that I could remove it, the interior. So the piece on the left is the interior of the wood log on the right. Whoa. And it's very, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it looks to you, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, if you cut everything small enough, you can do it. But then you've got a problem because you've got about a couple hundred pieces <laughs> that you have to put together again. Um, and uh, the exterior on the right was logical, rebuilding the visuals of the tree. And when, in that case, I, uh, I guess I used looking at it, a uh, cable ties and I stitched it together. And so, you know, it's hollow inside. And uh, then, uh, you know, and the, the thing that interested me so much, I found out, and there's, an, I think there's another one coming up, but uh, the piece on the left, rebuilding the interior uh, was possible, again, due to the nature of wood. Uh, I would glue things back together following the grain. I would find the wood grain, I'd mark it, I'd adjust everything. So that way I could put the entire thing together the way it grew. Only it's been 
you know, totally altered by my cutting and shifting, but, but I just recreated the tree again, the interior, and then I put them side by side and, you know, so I liked it. Like one's a tree, one's a sculpture, or I don't know, you know, they're both, <laughs> I mean, I mean, now I'm looking at it, I, I like the, you know, cement block base because that's the, you know, the cubes, the facets, the, the sections, uh, and the other one's open. So yeah. anyway. <laughs> I'm loving the two, just, they're about possibilities. Yeah. Which, which I mean, you, you, you don't often see the definition of a word. Can we, can we have the next, please? Yeah, this, this, so this is the same thing, I'm assuming. Same, same series, same series, a, you know, nondescript piece of wood I found by the side of the road. Uh, nondescript except it had all these branches and uh, it, it's a very different way of working for me because when I made the blocks I made them I directly I dove into the work these things sort of had to sit around I had to look at them for a while and figure it out and then I did essentially what I did with the previous piece uh, and I cut it up into smaller pieces cored it you know took out the insides and uh, rebuilt both of them uh, this is an extension of that, which I can explain was clearer on the one before, I think. Uh, but uh, the thing that, one thing that interested me was that if you see a tree, you understand it, you recognize it. But the other part, you don't so much. So in a funny way, the part that came out to me seemed bigger than what it came out from. So it seems sort of like an impossible thing. Uh, but you know, this is a, what I was discovering going, going inside. And the next, the next piece is, uh, it's called six cuts. Uh, I was thinking, so where do I stop? Uh, so I, this is done twice. In other words, the burl, the bottom was hollowed out, got the middle part, the middle part was hollowed out and gave the top part. And, uh, that's, you know, how, how that came together. So, and, and this, this actually is, and there are other ones in the show culmination. When I was doing these, I did the rubber pieces. And then I did the core sample pieces. And then I thought, uh, yes, but this is kind of ridiculous. I, I, everything doesn't have to be a dichotomy. It doesn't have to be two things matched up against each other. I have to figure out a way to put them together again, to make one object. And this is, you know, the results of that thinking. I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming this took months. These, these took a long time. I, yeah, not this one so much, but the others, <laughs> because they're smaller pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, I sort of had to pay attention to them, but they, you know, nothing, nothing was quick in this group of work. Wow. More, more analytical. I mean, it wasn't like I was working, you know, ah, okay, I'm going to work for eight hours on this uh, because, you know, a lot of looking and thinking about it. I love it. Can we have the next, please? So now... This, this, this is in the Andover show, right? Mm -hmm, this yes. is an installation shot. Um, well, I, I talk about it. We, we've sort of turned a corner here uh, because that, that core sample show with pieces like the last three, uh, I did, was it was at the Hood Museum. And uh, then sort of the end of that, that type of work and uh, I was back in the you know studio trying to figure out you know how I wanted to do things uh, and you know it's funny because I, I just had an opportunity to thought of making sculpture really small uh, and I started doing that and again I went from the slow work to this quick work and it was very freeing to me and and it's sort of like I mean, some of these are complex, but in general, the feeling was uh, you do one, it's kind of like, oh, is that it? Is that perfect? Is that so? Well, you know, I like it. Um, I, I remember that. I'll make another. In other words, I wasn't trying to reach perfection on anything. Instead, I was trying to get one idea, one sort of relationship out, and then uh, do it again. Maybe I was using the same size blocks or whatever. So I put this table in because it's kind of the way my studio is. Uh, I mean, you know, the, 
they're at this point, the early 2000s, is that there were all these small, you know, pieces on tables that I was thinking about, and all of them followed the same thing that I'd been doing of taking, you see a block at the bottom, like one in the center, everything on top of it came out of that block. And you can line up, you can see the, the white circle and you see where it was cut from. So there's, everything had this back and forth. Uh, but, you know, I changed it, I changed the positioning. So they were kind of uh, magical to me that, that, that each one was just that one piece of wood, you know, altered. And uh, now I was using the core, rather the core, whichever, the outside part as the base for the inside part, which was all kind of mixed up. So this was more of a putting the putting the two together, uh, and not you know just trying to show them side by side. And uh, the photographs in the background are something that I started at the same time, and uh, they are four by five feet. They are uh, Polaroid negatives that have been uh, printed uh, digitally as positives. And uh, I have, I've always had like a cameras around a four by five it's view camera. And I use the uh, Polaroid four by five film, which gave you both a negative and a positive. Uh, and I was familiar with this because pre-digital, every time you had an installation or you got a photographer over, you'd shoot the good pictures of the art were done on the four, with four by five transparencies, which have never been matched. They're, they're fantastic, but that's, it's an expensive process. So the photographer would put in the Polaroid pack and take a number of pictures first to see if the lighting was right, because that was cheaper and you could see that right then and there. And then you would shoot the, uh, the actual transparency. Um, but so I use that film and, uh, the thing is it gave you a negative and a positive and the positives were, man, I'm not very good. They're very gray. And the negative was really vibrant and kind of gooey. It was physical, you know, it's after you've swabbed it and put that stuff off. So, um, I found them much more interesting and actually, uh, I could learn things from them, uh, seeing inside is more like x-rays. So I, you know, I actually took pictures of pieces and, I understood them better. So they were kind of, I was using them, but again, it's just another transformation. And of course, scale wise, the, oh, the piece on the, the photograph on the upper left, I oh, can't really see it. Anyway, it's there somewhere, <laughs> but it might be six inches tall. We have the next. So colors coming back. Right. Or in my mind, it was never, <laughs> never but, really there for a long time, except for that red, yellow, blue way back there. But can you talk a little bit, I have to get up for what, can you talk a little bit about Robert Morris's box with sound of its own making? Yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've alluded to that because I wanted to make work, you know, coming out of process, kind of trying to dig my way out of that time period, really the installations the uh, I, really wanted to make something that was totally self self referential, an object that somehow made sense to itself. And, and the piece that uh, Phyllis is mentioning was a piece that Bob Morris did where he turned on a tape recorder and then he cut and sawed and hammered and put together basically an empty box, sort of like a foot square cube. And then he put the recording a recorder inside the box. And so you look at the box, you played it back and played back on a loop. So here in an empty room or empty space was this box sitting there uh, and these noises that came out of it, the sawing, the hammering, uh, all that stuff was, you know, so it's called box with the sound of its own making. Uh, and I wasn't aiming to do that, but I, I, it's the idea I liked. Uh, and uh, also, you know, I, you know, I, I, I worked with Dorothea Rockburn for a bit and she did some drawings called, you know, drawings that make themselves. Uh, I, all this self-referential stuff is very interesting to me. Uh, and so in this case, uh, I like the small pieces. I had a very large piece of wood and, uh, you know, I cut it up like the others and I shifted the bottom part to the top. The only thing that's really changed is from making these small pieces, 
I thought, I don't, these don't have to be so complex. It's just a simple move. I sometimes feel nobody, nobody gets it anyway. It's just me. So I take the bottom out and I put it on top and that seemed uh, really like enough. And uh, so I did that. Uh, well, I think the next picture will show the. Uh, the next one. Yeah. 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 Go on. You asked one moment. I think we'll, we'll switch to it in one second. Okay. Um, but it's the same, you know, it's the same concept only uh, this was sort of a one-off rarity, this big, you know, piece of strange wood. Uh, and I was never enamored by any particular wood. Uh, in terms of the woods I worked with, I vacillated between extremely ordinary and then, you know, then some things would come by like exotics, uh, like, uh, you know, that, but, you know, I didn't want to be using up the rainforest, uh, but it's always ironic because if, all the great wood has come from the, the barns of wood sculptors who, you know, saved it and saved it and saved it. Uh, so it's already a hundred years old or something, but this is just a piece of junky construction grade wood. Uh, and uh, anyway, but I, I just, uh, that was fine. <laughs> yeah, it's magical. Okay. We're here, we're here. It's a little gaudy, this picture, but yeah, this is, this is actually in this, in this show, the Addison, this is, this line of pieces is facing the green one. Uh, so now, um, I just remember Tony Smith explaining to me why he worked in black and it, it was, it, it was, it was just sort of, he felt that he it, black. You didn't see how he made them, but why? Why red? I mean, this this is kind of garish. Um, yes, uh, this is like the green piece there, and like some of the pieces on the table. Uh, I think once I started working with the trees, and I got so enamored of the inside outside part, uh, the trees have bark, and it's clear what the outside is, but. This method of working also with the black oil sculptures was to create a solid block of wood. In this case, it's uh, laminated, you know, mahogany, which, uh, and uh, you can see that you can see the seams. Yeah, three pieces of mahogany laminated together to form a block, just like the bottom parts say. And uh, then going in and cutting it out. But the red, the use of paint to me, I, I don't paint things. I don't mix paints. I don't, uh, I just use paint as a marker, or let me say this, I think of paint as a material, as another material. Uh, that doesn't explain the red. Uh, I, I just think that I gave the most normal, or to my memory, red, red, I could find. It could be, you know, little red rag wagon, or it could be, you know, my Milwaukee toolbox. It's just, if you want red, this is red. And I straight from the can. And, uh, you know, so I sort of scrumbled it on. That became, for want of a better way of saying it, the bark of these pieces. That's the exterior. And you could oh. match up the pieces. I love seeing it as a bark. I mean, when I see red, I think of flannel shirts. I think of Calder wearing a red flannel shirt. I think of George Siegel wearing a red flannel shirt. I think of Donald Judd wearing a red flannel shirt. <laughs> I do have a red shirt in the closet if I thought about this. <laughs> yeah, um, interesting. But uh, yeah, it's where the red came from. But it, it is the, the main thing with all these pieces is that the color goes on before the sculpture's made. Ah, OK. Can we have the next, please, I think? Yeah, so now we, we're with cement. We're with black and white. Um, did, you, did you make these pieces knowing they were going to go into Madison Square Park? Yeah, that's, that's one of the things is uh, making sculptures, you know, that had to happen. I mean, somebody's got to, <laughs> you know, would contract uh, for whatever the word is. Uh, and uh, they, uh, actually Martin Friedman, uh, 
saw that show of the red blocks and he said, you know, I want you to do something in Madison Park. And uh, they all thought, oh, you're going to do wood. But I know from some very bad experience, you can't just do put wood pieces outside. Uh, you know, they just don't work. They don't last. So I had this idea of uh, using cast concrete. And uh, one of my uh, earlier assistants worked for a, a fabricator who uh, does all the cornice work on buildings in New York or the corbelled arch in the, you know, whatever, uh, Washington Square, the deep stuff like that. And uh, I went to find someone who did, knew this stuff and I saw how they were doing it. They had computers that, hot wires that cut this, uh, this foam and then that became the uh, mold. So this whole process seemed kind of perfect for me. So I would make a block, like in this case, say the bottom of the first one, just like the red ones. And uh, then uh, going through the same process, all, all in not, not in concrete, and I take out the part that then you see on top. Uh, the stripes came late in the game, but they were sort of the breakthrough for me. Uh, because that they did essentially what wood grain did for me. They gave a, you know, a continuum and identity to where did this come from? Uh, so the stripes, you know, are not painted on the stripes. The pieces are cast in layers of black, then white, then black, then white concrete, very sort of complicated method. So, um, you know, they're really heavy and, uh, but I basically made them in black and white EPS foam. And so I knew exactly what they're going to look like. And then the top was cast in the bottom and the bottom was cast in the top. You don't have to really understand the whole thing, but it's like taking what I was doing before and putting another step in it. Uh, and we you know. have the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, plus the black and white served uh, many functions for me. And I, always have loved like the Italian Gothic cathedral Siena or different different Italian cathedrals where these black and white marble in this way and the black and white marble follows its own rules throughout the whole edifice across columns whatever it's just there and then all the other architectural details have to come through it or, or, or out of it and that it's a way of connecting these disparate elements uh, and uh, that's uh, something that I like doing because in a way it confuses you a little. It's a kind of a camouflage. Uh, you know, you can't really, it's harder to see the structure. Uh, in fact, in World War I, there was something called dazzle camouflage that where they painted uh, battleships, black and white zigzag, and you couldn't make out the profile of the ships. All this stuff I learned later. I was just thinking about that black and white marble, the urban setting, and the the fact that it had more to do with uh, you know old prison outfits or attention getting devices, not day glow, but something that wasn't natural and putting it in nature. Uh, and uh, and I, I, anyway, I mean I could go on and on about it, but that's <laughs> we have another we have another image too. Yeah, I forgot about prison uniforms. Yes. I remember the Three Stooges? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, before Dayglo, prison uniforms were black and white stripes, so you couldn't enter society too easily without being identified. Um, but, you know, it, it had a lot, the concrete, the crosswalks, the, the, the urban setting. And, uh, you know, then I called them markers because uh, they're not that big, really, as far as, you know, you know, sculpture, outdoor sculpture, but they are uh, quite visible. And that's what I wanted. Totally. Um, next group that I did uh, was the first one was called Markers. And this group was uh, Jacks. And I followed more or less the other. The markers were all very different. This was just like one concept carried through the one block, four layers and uh, you know, the same number of cuts, I think it's three tubes out of each. And uh, they each were, went on order, you know, one was 
just lifted up the far one. The next one was flipped on the side and was lifted up. And then the last two are on their, on their corners. Uh, and I call them jacks because I was actually thinking of the toy, you know, how they sit, the tumbling jacks. Yeah, can we have the next, please? Uh, so, yeah. Should we, should we just go through through these? We could go further because this is like uh, this would really sort of more take me back to uh, you know the the cedar piece and all that. So yeah. And this is this is our this is an installation shot again from from the Addison, mm -hmm. and I think we have an yeah some more Addison, and and the next one. Well, that piece is in the Addison, but that's not the shot there. Yeah. Um, so stunning. And are you working differently in a piece like this? I think we have the red one and a blue one. Um, yeah. yeah. Same thing about taking, taking, you know, on one hand, when I talk about it, I'm always, I'm always doing the same thing, but, uh, this, uh, was the holes that were cut out of another piece and, uh, I suddenly, like with those red ones in particular, I started stacking them and I found them really fascinating, amusing. Uh, you know, they, they stack, but they don't quite stack and uh, almost, uh, you know, lyrical, cartoonish. Uh, and it's, you know, just, I thought it was uh, not serious in a way, but very, uh, you know, very interesting objects, just stacking, which goes back to, you know, like what, is what was a, the first sculpture? I mean, aside from Venus of Willendorf, it would be, you know, stacked rocks, markers. And uh, that's what I did there. And this is uh, even more recent than those two, but it shows what I'm talking about because I was putting together these big uh, slabs of wood and uh, cutting out the holes and sort of balancing and putting them together. And then the final step in this one was I had the holes that's what's on the floor. And I thought that the piece needed to be higher. This is back to bases and how to, how to perceive as something the piece needed to be higher because it was too much the height of a person and what can I put it on? And then it was right there. So I, the piece is standing on the composite, the holes that were removed from it. So it's kind of a tautology in that way. Mel, it's astonishing what you can do with wood. This has just been a delight to see, to see the range and the decades. And I, I guess we should take some questions, but I'm just in awe of, of what we've been looking at today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis and Mel. And we do have questions coming in um, while we're asking them. If anyone else would like to ask one in the chat, please do, and I'll call on you. First, we're going to go to GE Schwartz, and I'll ask you to turn on your mic now, GE. Thank you, and good afternoon. This has been astounding. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I can't think, I can't help thinking, does the nature of the materials, has that been more of a guide to your proceeding uh, then perhaps in, in a kind of deep ecological way, then maybe even the the work of others that came before you. Um, I think the e ecological aspects are, you know, I wouldn't say they're not by chance, but my way, but you know, my work certainly fits into uh, you know the total use of this natural material, uh, and I don't throw anything away. And so it's totally self-referential and it's all there. And, but, you know, that came from a theoretical point of view. And I just feel, uh, it feels good that it happens to lock in with, uh, you know, when my feelings about, you know, whatever, the ecology and the waste. Um, but the first part is how did the, and, and somebody used it writing about me. I saw that, that they always say, you know, Michelangelo says, oh, I'm just looking at, I'm releasing the figure from the stone. Uh, and I hate to say it, but this couldn't be further from the truth here. Uh, I, I feel like I'm going against the material. 
most of the time. And so I'm not discovering the beauty. I think things can be beautiful for all different reasons, but I'm not discovering something in it. But the thing that I really like about wood is the resistance. In other words, the resistance of a material that you have to fight with a little. And, uh, it, and so, yeah, that has a lot to do with the resistance, the limitations of wood have a lot to do with how I make things and the, the shape, whatever they become. So, so that aspect is very important. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, GE. Next, we'll go to Malika. Thank you, Lewis. Um, Mal, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to you speak uh, and sharing these images in the back end. Um, I had a question. I feel like so much of what you're, um, you've been speaking about is about questions of framing and questions of like presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed hearing about sort of like the pipe legs, the pedestals, uh, the examples of you cutting the vase out of the artwork itself or, you know, abstracting the artwork out into the visible and the invisible. Um, and I guess our question is, is there a particular way that you are would love your work to be curated? Or, you know, what is a way perhaps that you have not been curated? Um, or maybe a very beautiful and unique way that you have been curated in the past. And sort of, as I was listening to you speak, I was I was thinking you must have thoughts on the ideal broader curation of your work. That's very interesting because I'm not quite sure how you're using the work, except I, I hear that it's like like the word organate, organized differently or perceived differently in a way that channels perception in a certain way, uh, which is, you know, actually what I try to do with this show uh, because you move through these different uh, eras, like maybe each one was a room. Uh, but I'm trying to think what, uh, what, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what someone else can do. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, I like collaborating. Uh, and I, you know, and as you said, your presentation framing. Oh, well, well one, th one thing that was really an eye opener to me was when I did the uh, Madison Park pieces, the, the uh, markers, was because, you know, all my adult life as an art maker or object maker, uh, I required an audience that was, you know, prepped for it. In other words, I showed in a gallery in New York or a museum and only people who go there, people who already are interested in art in theory and know something about it. And so I, I was always wondering about this challenge of putting it out in front of people who don't come with those preconceptions. In other words, they're just on their lunch break. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, is the beauty and the challenge of public art because you know it has to function on what I can only say is more than one level. Uh, and, and it also has to have a bit of an element that I kind of thought I was left out of my work, which is a little bit of seduction. In other words, it has to you know, appeal uh, to someone. And so it was very gratifying with you know, Madison Park with its 20,000 people walking through it every day was to watch people stand there and point and look and explain things to their friends. And, uh, and that to me was so rewarding because this is a very, the art world could be very insular, <laughs> very small. And I think so in terms of what you're saying, I think I would like more of that. I like the idea of reaching a more general audience, regardless of you know, your knowledge, your education, your background. And I thought that it actually succeeded with that work. Thanks, Mel. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, an audience member that had to leave already had asked about um, your work that was included in the William Carlos Williams book. And I'm thinking maybe this could also be an opportunity to talk about the works on paper and how they fit into your practice more broadly. Right. Um, well, Cora in Hell was the book, uh, and uh, I was asked to do, uh, you know, some, you know, wood blocks, which is what I was doing. You see, the first thing, as I said earlier, I, I don't, you know, draw. I don't, uh, you know, even David Smith, like, drew things, feel, things that felt like the sculpture would be, and I, I don't do that kind of work. So, uh, 
everything that I figure out in making an object happens while I'm making it and the drawing is within the object. So when moving to two dimensions, uh, it was, I wasn't really sure how or what and I, but I did start with, you know, somebody prompted me, I started with wood cuts, wood blocks, because that would be the logical place to start. But of course I had to completely reimagine the process. So the wood blocks uh, were made not by, you know, etching or making small marks in wood, but by cutting through the wood and cutting through layers of wood, two layers, three layers of different, different qualities of wood and reversing the orders. So, and the thing that's so great, it's kind of like photography is you do this and then you ink it up and then you see something, uh, you know, the result, which isn't always exactly what you expect, but the point is a long way of getting around to, so when it came to the, uh, the William Carlos Williams book, uh, I uh, don't, I mean, the structure of the wood blocks that I put in uh, was linear. Each one was led to the next, uh, literally. I mean, one, for instance, had based on one hole, two holes, three holes, four holes, but they're all the same block altered for the next print. And, and so that's sort of how I responded to the nature of uh, a book, a written book going through it. Uh, and I did three series like that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I liked his writing. I somehow felt that was appropriate. And I, th I think that actually I took my an initial image from the front frontispiece of the original version of it, which was almost like a little spermatozoa. And I don't know what it was, but it was an image. And so I kind of used that shape, which was very much like the loops and the lines I cut out of wood. And I, I took off from that point. Great. I'm curious if you have other writers that you would love to be in dialogue with in the um, future. I find that very difficult, actually. It's not a natural fit. Uh, and uh, because it's kind of like the trouble I have with, I don't name many things. You know, well, you see a lot of untitled, or I would name them just by the materials because it's all the things themselves because I'm not referencing anything else, anything. And that's very important to me. So it's very hard to be asked to reference something else on purpose, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, so like I'm more apt to bend something that I'm already doing into that format. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a, you know, it sounds like a great idea and I would, you know, if I did it more, you do anything more, you get, you get looser and you, you know, it could be easier. And that, that's just the nature of work. Uh, but uh, at the moment, that's not something I, I seek out. Thank you. I think our next question will come from Ty. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, thank you, Phyllis and Mel, for such a great conversation today. Um, I'm wondering, Mel, if there are types of wood that you prefer working with over others, like cedar or oak or anything like that. And then also adjacently, um, if there are like, if you choose only based on the material qualities of the wood, or if there's some other influence that goes into that. Um, well, you know, I, I, I literally, to begin with, was just using whatever was at hand. and. Uh, you know, I started out using the shelving that was in my workspace when I moved into it, or then I built things. I was, you know, redoing, fixing loss up for people. So I made sculpture out of uh, two by fours and even sheetrock. I, I, I just, you know, used what was at hand. Once I moved to wanting a chunkier, you know, something piece of wood, and I also, I felt it was very important to get away from dimension lumber, which is what that is, two by three, four by four. That's, that's in construction, that's dimension lumber, and we all know it. Uh, and so in order to break that relationship or that recognition, you know, so you can't say, oh, there's something made from a two by four. I, I had to get closer to the origin of the wood in some way. And that's where my downstairs neighbor was so helpful. Uh, because he pretty much, you know, brought that that stuff, the rough stuff, in the into my life. Uh, but the main thing with all working with wood for anyone is that the wood can has to be dry, and that's the big hurdle. 
uh, because people say, oh, you know, actually in Westchester, there's some of the best, you know, black walnut in the country. Uh, and they say, oh, we have this giant black walnut tree, you know, fall down, you know, maybe you could come by and take it. Um, but unfortunately, that's of no use to me <laughs> because uh, it will take, uh, you know, a three foot thick, you know, it will never dry or it has to be cut into slices and dried slowly, but it can't be kiln dried and kiln dried, of course, is what it sounds like. And so basically for stable work lumber, unless I find a really old piece of wood, it has to come through that process. And that's why I wound up with things like black walnut and uh, poplar and mahogany, which are things that I can get four inches thick. So it's really um, I don't think I'm answering part of your question there, but but that's uh, that's sort of the thing about wood. And as just back to the idea of the exotics, which you know at some point came from the rainforest, you know, and that's doesn't seem right, or maybe it was even illegal. But you know, what do you do when it winds up in front of you? This uh, ebony that was so valuable, it's sold by the pound, uh, and then you know, but sculptor dies, somebody. People seem to give these things to me, and then I've sort of got a quandary, <laughs> you know, they, because to not use it is a crime, too, in a way. And uh, and I kind of like the, you know, I, this gets back to the ecology of it. Is maybe you know I'm doing a good thing because I'm not making it into piano keys. I'm uh, you know kind of just using it all and putting it back together. But uh, it's it's an uncomfortable thing. And one last thing about ebony is. It is so dense that it's really not like working with wood. It's as though you're working with cutting through plastic, ironically. So, you know, every wood's very different. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Mel. We'll close with some comments from the Rail Zone publisher, Fong Bui. Fong, okay. you should be able to turn on your mic. Fong, are you there? Oh, so I think you have to turn on your mic. Thank Great. you so much, Louis. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Phyllis. I was in a meeting, so I didn't hear the whole entire uh, tea of, uh, of this conversation, but for what I heard was terrific. Thank you so much. And always have been an admirer of male work for a long time. And, but current, at the moment, I'm thinking of male's work maybe in a different light because what we can say here, Phyllis, this is one of the great pleasure of having continue and talking to the artists. This is what we learned from the great Urban Sandler, our belated, most admired art historian is on the spot with the artists. This is what we're doing. We constantly learn when we talk to the artists. So I always assume something I know that maybe I did know a little about male, but not any longer. Learn something more now. But at the moment I'm thinking just now, I feel that always that there's two aspects in male's work just now just thinking at very moment. One, it seemed to be a, a strong emphasis on skeletal element of the work, you know, Phyllis? The skeletal, under below the skin of whether be it Tony Smith, which has been mentioned, whether be it maybe Ronald Bladen. So that's an also relationship with it. Uh, in other words, if the skin of the form wrap around Tony Smith sculpture or Ronald Bladen, they don't know who else. Mel will have the, I guess, <laughs> the bones and the vein underneath, you know? And the other thing I'm thinking it right now is uh, the inherent relationship to movement uh, is not static, which is something that we always been defined to minimalist sculpture as a whole. So between the skeletal below the skin as a structure, and the movement itself. I wonder when you discover early on, Mel, your response to minimalist sculpture. Pro, I mean, thing that you love, thing that you want to resist and thing that you would create in response to. Well, um, you know, that's what got me to New York. I mean, I was, that's why I uh, went to Hunter College with Tony Smith and Robert Morris. Uh, and it was, you know, reading the art magazines in college. And here was work that 
seemed so important and yet so hard to understand. <laughs> so it was a challenge. And uh, when I came to New York, I must say my work changed from, uh, you know, greatly, you know, sort of un maybe it got serious or got too serious or something because everything had to, you know, go with theory. Uh, that's basically what I've been working out of. Uh, so, I mean, that, that minimalism was sort of the ground zero that was, you know, had to go beyond it, uh, you know, but how, uh, how, how to break it. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, kind of like at least the whole first part, maybe my whole career was like doing that because, mm -hmm. you know, that was the end of the modernist, you know, you, everybody, you know, start with Mondrian, you go down the Broadway boogie woogie, you know, that, and then the minimal and then conceptual, these are names everybody hates, but, you know, it was, uh, still had to start again, had to make things. And so that's why I felt my pieces had to have internal justification because I couldn't justify it. I'm not saying, oh, springtime or, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm not responding to, you know, an emotion or something, but they had to, you know, support themselves in some way. Uh, and I like the skeletal thing and because uh, both Ron, Ronnie and, uh, and Tony, uh, their original pieces were plywood on a, you know, constructed like two by four frame and then, you know, covered with tar or whatever they were using at that time because nobody could afford to make, you know, the big steel sculptures that some of them became. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, I've always, thought about that um, when you have a oh, scaffolding, you know, you build something with a scaffolding uh, or in this terms of sculpture, an armature, you know, something that's going to directing you and, you know, you get to some point where you have to kick it away. <laughs> kick it, you know, thing has to, you know, stand on its own. Uh, and and this is, this goes for not just physically, this goes for ID ideas. Like you have a theory, but then, oh, you know, get rid of that because what are you looking at? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, just a few days ago, I was rereading Deborah Britka Balkan's terrific essay on um, Guston, mm -hmm. um, particularly the Nixon drawing, you know, Phyllis? Right. And then some point, she talk about Guston being you know, an artist who love all art history, who have the ability to go further back a certain period when it calls out for that Pacific references. And I feel having you mentioned Tatlin, which I can't help but be being reminded too, when he came to Paris with Malevich to visit Picasso, that was 1913 and then come back, came back, returned to Moscow, and immediately create his first corner counter-relief sculpture in the manner of. So it's interesting, and I can't help but to think of uh, Picasso guitar that is a gift to Bill Rubin when he paid P the visit to Picasso in, in the, after the war, or maybe even as late as early 50, you would, you should correct me this, Phyllis. 73. 73, so it's much yeah. later. That right. war, no, that war. Yeah, <laughs> so that's 1914, uh, one of the first ever relief uh, sculpture he made. But I can't really help but to think of the, uh, the Pacific series he did with the Picasso guitar, of course, 1912, and then there's mandolin with clarinet, 1914, and there's violin, 1915. And so there's a strings of work mail that was dedicated to instrument, things that capable of producing sound, you know? Uh, so yeah. I, I can't, I mean, is there a relationship in your work? Because in addition to the fact that it, it amplified in a certain tendency towards movement and whatnot, is there a, any relation to sound? I mean, do you play an instrument? I think you play some instrument. Am I right, Mel? Well, yeah, this is like yeah, reading tea leaves. Yes, I did play some instrument. I did play, <laughs> like, I did play the guitar like everyone else. I did, was in a band. We did make a record, but that was, I was a teenager. So, but music has, uh, you know, been, uh, yeah. I mean, we're always, I always playing music, you know, this part is part of, uh, 
you know, the world I live in and it's, uh, you know, maybe it's, it just helps me concentrate. So it's always there and it's not, and I must say it's not very sophisticated music either. We don't have to go into <laughs> but okay. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I do, I, I do depend on that. That sort of keeps me, you know, keeps me going, keeps me working. Um, well, thank you so much. That's all my, my question is just, I have other, but I will come and pay a visit in person super soon at your studio. Great. I love that. I yeah, love can't that. Wait. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Phyllis. Back to you, Lewis. Thanks, Mel and Phyllis. Thank you everyone for your questions. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome our po poet laureate of the day, Edwin Torres, to the stage. Edwin Torres's poetry collections include The Animal's Perception of Earth from Double Cross Press, Zoetiak's The Infinite Word Object from Wave, Ameriscopia from University of Arizona Press, and the editor of The Body and Language, an anthology from Counterpath Press, other anthologies include Manifold Criticism, Fractured Ecologies, American Poets in the 21st Century, Poetics of Social Engagement, and Kindergard, Avant-Garde Poems for Children. His next, books will, his next book will be released this fall from Roof Books entitled Quanundrum, I Will Be Your Many Angled Thing. Edwin, over to you. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, what a fabulous discussion. You can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay. Um, what a fabulous discussion. I, I made some notes. I have two short pieces before I get to them. Uh, I wrote something about the porosity of wood and how you mentioned how um, uh, that gives back. And it made me think of how language, the porosity of language is what gives back to me. So the connections between my work and what you spoke about are many layered. Um, poetry for me is so much about making, about the construction, the, the sculpture of language, literally. but. Your, your, your perspectives on negativity or negative spaces in and out and, and the making and, and the, the creating out of everything are so connected to my interest in language. So it's awesome to kind of have that, you know, there. Um, thank you for that. I have two short pieces. Uh, the first is a piece that's in the current issue of Tribes magazine. And the second piece uses a sound piece by this sound artist I've been collaborating with, Stephen Vitello, who I send him recordings of my voice and he makes pieces out of them. So this sort of um, audio sculptures in a similar vein. So that's the second piece. So the first piece is this and it'll go straight into that one. Let me, I need to share my um, audio. So I'll do that. And here we go. So this is, this is entitled, Your Roos for a Bone. What body has never been shared? And then I feel the drop of that sharing, what verb does to done. And then I see the someone trying to figure my stance. And there you have a through line, what might be lineage to add weight to something so linear seems internally unintelligent as though connection has a ways to go before discovering how useful to recommend itself. If that isn't non-linearity, I don't know gristle from tomb of unknown sun. And then how you place your world is what you let in. To not claim your springing from as you're awake. How kids drop things and parents pick them up and then, you know, drop them again in the same way, what we call gravity as the getting up again. Matter. Again. Of Again. so Again. little to know. Again. So little to Again. be. Again. Man Again. and mouth. Again. Again. Not Again. Again. to speak. Again. Not hear. Again. Open. Again. Exit. Again. 
present stance. Open stance. Man stance. Whole entirety. Perfect. Perfect landscape. Does it know what it was? Where I was speaking just now, I am standing here like one man. Leave me alone. Now I listen. Now I listen wrong. Now I listen. Look at Anna. To stack Anna. Of large. Of little. Anna. Of nothing. I kissed you. And it was not you I was kissing. Man. From now to what you read, you hear, you reach, you out further. A light source. Hammered by gods. Men in full, but really so little to know. Say N. yes. N. A diagram of N. yes. N. Followed N. by N. angles N. that end. Did N. I N. What will N. move the world forward N. is the not world. N. What will move the word N. forward is the N. not word. N. What will move the what will move the wish? Now I list now I list wrong now I list I mean look I mean go I mean show up and doesn't it warn anymore and just says um here you? Yeah. So yeah. there they stay, where I need them. Yeah. You out there. Yeah. Did I really yeah. want so much? Yeah. Reduced to bone, yeah. bod, square, page, yeah. counting whole. Yeah. The matter of yeah. look. Of heart of N. meter. N. N. What will move forward I can. N. N. Will not move I will. N. The non ventriloquil I feel. N. The assembly N. could shape shift too fast. You. N. Er N. N. Too fast. N. 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 Every brick. N. N. All of it. so much Edwin that was amazing and thank you Phyllis and Mel and everyone for asking questions and who came out this was a wonderful conversation um, and I hope to get to the chance to see the show and if not when it comes to the parish um, we do this every weekday at 1 p.m. so join us Monday for a conversation between Jerome Reyes and Jessamine Batario we'll also conclude with a poetry reading then I'll now make sure that everyone can turn on their microphones and say goodbye as they leave Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phyllis, thank you, Mel. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beautiful Phyllis. job. Edwin, Edwin amazing. Edwin, that was amazing. Yeah. Woo! What a reading. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, your wonderful conversation to be continued. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Mel. Hey, thanks, Phyllis. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. So wonderful. Great.